I mean, this organic matter for Florida soil, I mean, that's amazing. Yes. And we're not bringing in compost or manure. This is just from chop and drop. So let them be really, really ripe on the tree, pop them off and eat them. Hey, my name is Chris with Permaculture FX and a natural farm. I want to share with you today our food forest. Uh, my background is in permaculture where the food forest is something that you can walk into and everything that you see is edible, it's medicinal, creates beauty, creates wonder. And I think there's a stereotype that a food forest has to look like the Shire or Hobbiton, uh, but you can really integrate a food forest in, even into a suburban backyard to where there's repeating patterns but still uses the permaculture design and mindset. So in our food forest here, we use what's called the stun method, severe, total, utter neglect. So basically we put in one or two weeks of work at the beginning of the season, neglect the heck out of it, and then one or two weeks at the end of the season. And that's how we manage our food forest. So everything that you see as you come on in here is gonna be edible, it's medicinal, it's usable, uh, whether for humans, livestock, or even feeding the soil itself. In fact, even our ground cover down the middle is edible and medicinal. So we've got five different types of clover that are fixing the soil, repairing atmospheric nitrogen, putting that back into the soil. We've got radishes, diacon radishes, and turnips that not only are we eating, but chickens are eating, cattle are able to eat, uh, and then it's creating good biomass for us. So when we look here in the food forest, I'll give you a tour of some of the things that you you can really easily do in your backyard. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. You don't have to put in 30 or 40 hours a week, a full-time job into creating your own food. You could have a small half an acre plot and still be able to experience abundance in a really easy way. So take a look over here at the side. We've got some diacon radishes. Now these radishes in the next couple months will be as big as your forearm here. Very mild radish that you can use to make kimchi if you like the good Korean food. Uh, we have some kemetsuna greens and these kemetsuna are in the same family as bok choy but they're a higher density nutrient green. You can either eat them fresh or even saute them. Calendula flower that's really good for skin, for immune system. It's antiviral, antifungal. One of my favorites here right now is the mustard green. Uh, this one is better to cook or to saute because you know it's a mustard green. It's a little bit spicy. I just did this uh, about two weeks ago sauteed them up with butter. You gotta have a lot of butter, salt, pepper, garlic, some Parmesan cheese and a glass of white wine and you are good to go. Um, so that's just a really fun one. We do a lot of pollinators. These ones here are uh, zinnias. We have cosmos, mainly for pollination and beauty because to be honest, in a food forest or a garden, you do wanna have some things that are just for fun, that are enjoyable, that are beautiful, because what feeds your eyeballs is gonna also help feed your heart a little bit. Now in our food forest here, this is a learning garden. So we have a lot of these signs that give you a little bit of information about each individual tree, some growing tips, and maybe some companion planting. Now, one of the things that I really like to try to focus on in permaculture is to never let a tree be planted alone. So don't just stick a tree in the ground, put wood chips around it, give it some friends, you know, give it some things that are gonna support it. So if you're a first time gardener in your backyard and you wanna put a food forest in, try doing these three things. Put in the main fruit tree, give it a biomass accumulator, which is fancy for a plant that's gonna feed another plant, and then give it a pollinator. So if you give it a pollinator and something that's gonna build the soil, that tree is gonna do 100 times better. So this one here, for example, is called the Moringa. In Africa, it's known as the tree of life. Every part of this tree is edible or medicinal. Now I'm not a family care physician, so before you add anything into your diet, please check with your family care physician and make sure that it's gonna be a good fit for you. But the Moringa tree has protein, it has B vitamins, it has seven of the nine amino acids in it, and these uh, have a really nice kind of horseradishy taste, great in soups and stews and salads, 
seeds. If you dry them and grind them up, you can make it into a powder that will last for a couple years. The flowers on the tree, which are, are mostly gone this time of year, uh, you can saute them. And in Ayurvedic medicine, they use the flowers for any men's issues and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, the seeds on the Moringa tree I think are really fun. You can open up the drumstick pods and in Africa they'll take a handful of the seeds drop them in a bucket of water and all of the sediment goes to the bottom and you can cup fresh water right off the top. So it's a great way to help purify and cleanse the water to be able to use it. So this is the tree of life or the Moringa tree, uh, excellent survival tree, but grows really well with nasturtiums, marigolds, garlic chives, all those things are really gonna work together to make the Moringa tree very, very healthy. Now what we also do is we take the Moringa tree in some locations and we chop it and we drop it. So a chop and drop uh, crop is basically one that we're using to primarily feed the soil. So if you're chopping and dropping the moringa, this can be done five to six times out of the year and just cut it off, throw it down at the base of the tree, and that's going to help build the soil and other areas of the garden. So we grow moringa trees a lot around our avocado trees because avocados are a little bit heavy feeders. So we'll do a moringa tree to build the biomass of the soil and then probably a pigeon pea on the other side to help repair the nitrogen. So come on down a little bit more. You can see a lot of the greens are really doing well this time of year. Now in Florida, a lot of these greens can be grown November through about February. So this is a Florida hardy mustard that will not bolt. Uh, some more of the red mustard greens, uh, some kale. I love the blueberries this time of year. They're just showing off, which is totally okay with me. Uh, and lots of uh, just, just fun acid loving things that are around the base and nasturtiums. Nasturtiums is one of my favorite one, because I'm a huge Lord of the Rings fan and they're all over the Shire and Hobbiton. Uh, but two, this is a multi-purpose plant. Now the flowers on the nasturtium are edible. They taste peppery, a little bit radishy. The leaves are edible. I like them on like a tuna fish salad sandwich is bueno bueno. Um, but in the garden, it's a great insectary plant and it does two things. On one side of its job, it's going to bring in all of the beneficial insects, the braconid wasp that are going to attack tomato hornworms, but it's also an insect trap. So aphids are going to go after the nasturtium before they attack your tomatoes, your peppers, and your eggplants. So what I do is revenge. When I see aphids all over my nasturtium, I cut it off and I feed the whole plant to my chickens. So keep coming down here a little bit. One of my favorites that we've got in the food forest is a great self-seeder. Uh, this is the cranberry hibiscus. The leaves of this are like a cranberry lemonade in flavor. You can actually even eat the flowers um, on this one as well. The flower petals you can just throw in a salad. One of my favorite ways to use the cranberry hibiscus is in a steak and blue cheese salad, some raspberry vinaigrette on top, and you're winning at life. Uh, but you can also do a tea out of the leaves of the cranberry hibiscus. Now this is different than the Jamaican sorrel that most people are using for uh, tea, but I'll show you that in a little bit here. Coming down this way, underneath of our fruit trees, you can see this is a peach tree, for example. This is one of the Tropic Beauty peaches. Tropic Beauty is one of my favorite peaches for Central and South Florida because it's it's a good sized peach, yellow and orange on the inside. I had a beard earlier this year, and when you bite these peaches, it just drips down your beard. I mean, it is so, so good, and this was a great peach year. But around our peaches, we do some chop and drop as well. Comfrey is one of my favorite chop and drops because this one is one of the best ones to bring deep minerals up to the surface. Now an established comfrey plant, you'll actually get um, almost a, a two meter to four meter taproot that goes down. And that taproot is gonna bring up calcium, manganese, magnesium, boron, vitamin E and selenium. So think about what this equates to. It's a mineral block. So for those of you that have chickens or you have cattle or livestock, it's a great natural way to replace those mineral blocks and bring it naturally into the diet. Now in central Florida and most places that have sandy soil, this is an excellent addition because you're deep mining all of those minerals up. And every time you chop it and you drop it on the soil, you're bringing those minerals up to a place where it's more usable and bioavailable for the tree and also for you. Now this is also usable in human 
human uh, activities. Now, not as an edible, but medicinally back in the uh, Greco-Roman era in the Colosseums, comfrey, they would take it and use it as a poultice. It was called bone knit or bone heel, and they would crush it up in a pestle and mortar, and they would pack it onto wounds of like the gladiators, and it would help increase healing. And there are some scientific studies. I believe the University of Maryland at, uh, at Baltimore has a great study showing it increased the healing of ligaments, joints, uh, and muscle tissue by about 14%, which is pretty decent. So it's great to apply topically, not one that humans should be eating, you know, orally. But around the base of these, we kind of have some natives. We've got some that we have brought in. One of the best weeds in all of the South in the United States is the one that gets all over everybody's yoga pants, not my yoga pants, y'all. But they get over your yoga pants, they stick in the Spanish needle. So Biden's Alba or Biden's Pilosa, uh, both uh, of those strains are edible, they're medicinal. The leaves of this were used back in the Civil War as a replacement for penicillin. So because they have antiviral, antifungal, antibacterial properties, in an open wound, you could take it as a poultice and put it inside as a poultice. You can actually drink the leaves uh, in a tea. You can cut them up, saute them. I do them in eggs, scrambled eggs in the morning. Uh, but it's one of the most medicinal, natural native plants that we have in this area but we consider it a weed. So we do let some grow here because it's also a native food source for a lot of the fritillary butterflies, uh, lace wings and that sort of thing. So we do let it grow in naturally here, but we've also added in some calendula, uh, some leucina, a lot of kale, some brassicas. These are some of the ginger and turmerics. This is a, a yellow turmeric uh, that's kind of at the end of the season, getting ready to harvest those guys here pretty soon. All right, in this section of the food forest, we have a little bit more of the Ayurvedic uh, type herbs. This one over here is the holy basil, I've got a little honeybee, holy basil or the Tulsi, uh, which is really good as an adaptogen. I like it really nice in a tea. Um, the leaves, the flowers, just throw them in some hot water. And as an adaptogen, it helps regulate your cortisol levels and the absorption of B vitamins, but it makes a beautiful tea. Uh, some more cranberry hibiscus, we have it growing everywhere. And this little red flowered one, here that the honeybees are all over is called tropical sage it is a native perennial it's not an edible sage but again this is exactly why we leave it in the food forest is the honeybees are having a great time with it this morning and if they're happy our fruit trees are going to be happy um, so they're having a great time down in here we've got some of the brazilian spinach or shizu um, which is a really good crunchy uh, tropical spinach let me pick one off here so this one, the leaves are almost uh, crunchy in texture. This is a really good lettuce or spinach to use like on a hamburger because the lettuce holds up to the heat and keeps its shape. It doesn't melt all over, but it adds a really nice crunch to the salad. The leaves remind me of that plant, uh, Hindu rope is kind of what it reminds me of a little bit. Some sugar cane. We've got another uh, peach tree here with an air potato kind of growing up here at the base of it. So that's one of the other layers in our food forest system as our vining layer. And because the peach trees here have a nice open center that's airy, promotes that airflow, it's a great place to trellis other plants up. So in some of the garden, we have some yard beans. We grow the air potatoes up them. We have morning glories growing up them. I even have a fun one called a cup and saucer plant that's just really pretty to grow up the center of the fruit trees. And along this side of the farm is our avocado grove. Uh, so this one is a joey avocado, which is one of the first ones to fruit in the season. It's a smaller avocado, but very hardy down to 15 to 17 degrees. What's cool about joey is you can eat the skin. You just eat it just like an apple. And it's almost like a star anise kind of flavor to it, which is a very unique avocado for flavor wise, but it is a really fun one. And next to our avocados, you can see we've got pigeon peas, we have moringas, uh, some sweet potatoes that are growing down at the base. This particular sweet potato is the Okinawan purple. So it's a really deep purple magenta sweet potato. Now the leaves on a sweet potato are just as edible as the sweet potato themselves. Saute these guys with some garlic, salt, pepper, Parmesan cheese, and you're good to go. Throw them in, in your scrambled eggs, in soups and stews. You can do them in salads, but the Texture is a little bit too hard for me, but wonderful, wonderful plant and grows from uh, just little propagations, again, to propagate most plants. 
strip it down just like this, drop it in a mason jar and let it root in. Put it in some soil and you're pretty good to go. Sweet potatoes in most of Florida, you can plant these slips in the ground almost year round in Florida. If we get a hard freeze, this will die back, but a lot of times the roots will come right back. And it takes about 120 days in most parts of Florida um, to go from a slip, oop, go from a slip to a sweet potato harvest. So pretty easy, easy to do. So down in this section of the food forest here, uh, this is kind of your salad bar area. Uh, so we have some uh, watermelon radishes. Those will be ready in a couple weeks. Some of the red mustard greens again. I mean, these are just humongous. And with those red colors, you're getting the anthocyanins in your diet. You're getting more antioxidants. You're getting more B vitamins and biotin. Uh, this is one of my favorites as far as the tropical salads. This is the salad, uh, South Sea salad tree. It gets big yellow flowers, similar to an okra. Uh, you can eat the flowers, you can eat the leaves on this. The leaves are a little bit more viscous, so I like this better cooked myself. Uh, but this is a great one to, to grow in a, in a back of an area because it does get you know, eight or 10 feet tall, uh, a little bit bigger, but these awesome ginormous leaves are kind of a cool, you know, statement in the garden. The morning glories are starting to fizzle out for the day and we don't use the morning glories, you know, edibly or medicinally, but again, this is eye food. You know, it really does just help with your eyeballs. And then as far as our tomatoes this year, we interplant all of our tomatoes in together. We have chop and drop moringa that when they start growing up a little bit like this, we just rip it off, throw it in the midst of the tomatoes to help feed the tomatoes a little bit. Uh, these are all heirloom tomatoes from Baker Creek or rareseeds.com. Blush tomato is my favorite. It's a kind of a watermelon sized tomato, yellow with red stripes down it, but it is the sweetest tomato tomato on the planet. It is so stinking good. Uh, got some Cherokee purple, some brandy wine. Got to have your brandy wine tomatoes. Going to be a good year for ox hearts. Our ox heart tomatoes are already looking really good as well. Now at the base of this uh, peach tree here, we've got some longevity spinach. Longevity spinach we grow as a ground cover. Now if you look in here, it grows so thick and so dense, the weeds just don't come up in this. And literally, we haven't weeded this area in months and months and months. Longevity spinach is a tender perennial, so it may die back in the winter months, but I literally just break off a cutting like this on longevity spinach, put that in a mason jar in a sunny window, and in a few weeks, it's gonna root out for you. But this is a great spinach to eat fresh in soups and stews and salads. Chop it up, put it in scrambled eggs in the morning. Uh, but this is a really good one for for lowering cholesterol levels and it can help normalizing blood sugar. Uh, so it's a really good medicinal uh, as well as an edible. In this area, this is one of our pollinating plants called a moonflower. And you can see it's just closing up for the day and it's only 1030. The moonflower only blooms at night, but this is a great one to plant if you've got a lot of dragon fruit because dragon fruit flowers in the evening. And this is gonna bring in a lot of those evening nighttime moths that are gonna naturally help pollinate your dragon fruit. Cause y'all, I ain't got time to sit with a paintbrush and tickle the inside of all my dragon fruit flowers. Nobody's got time for that. So we do the moonflower here to help pollinate our dragon fruit and the night blooming stuff. Another one, if you are growing dragon fruit, is the night blooming Sirius or the queen of the night uh, grows uh, kind of up trees. Uh, that's another great evening bloomer that can help with the nighttime pollinating plants. And again, when you look into the food forest area here, there's a lot of stuff just growing up in all together. We have the pollinator here with the zinnias and the cosmos, some red Russian kale. Uh, this is another heirloom tomato variety, a moringa tree and a lucina or a tamarind actually I think that one is uh, that we just use as chop and drop and you can see we chop these off all the time. I mean five to twelve times a year we're cutting them, throwing them back down on the food forest. This one here with the dew all over it is the uh, one that most people use for tea. This is the Jamaican sorrel or roselle. This is the part you use for the tea. You break off the part of the calyx here. You can eat these fresh in a salad and they taste just like cranberries. Uh, or you can dry them and save them all winter long. You can add them into a tea and they're uh, great with some nutmeg, some cinnamon, some allspice, some orange, uh, some mulled wine. Uh, it's a really nice tea or a mulled wine additive for 
for the holidays. And of course, save the seed head, let it dry out, and then replant for next year. The leaves of Jamaican sorrel or roselle are also edible. They have more of a lemony flavor to them. So I like this one in fish tacos because it's like the lemon flavor in the fish tacos. So it's a nice tart lemon flavor. And this one here is an annual. So it can self seed, but it definitely does die back in the winter. So when it gets to this size, it's kind of done for the year. I've already harvested hundreds and hundreds of calyxes. Mine are already dried. Um, and so at this time, I just feed it to the chickens. Now in this food forest, we do have some of the lantana. And I'm aware that in most of Florida, lantana is invasive. But if you look at the pollination on this, it is pretty crazy. You do want to be careful with lantana and leaving this in a native setting, especially if you have animals with rumens, uh, cattle, uh, horses, goats, because this is extremely dangerous for any animal with a rumen. But in a food forest setting as a pollinator, it is a wonderful pollinator if you can keep the lantana in check. Uh, this is our winter Mexican avocado tree. This is probably the latest of the fruiting avocados because it starts in like November, but they don't ripen on the tree. So you can literally leave these fruit on the tree and in February, you could be harvesting avocados off the tree. So in Florida, I like to space out the fruiting and ripening season of my avocados. So for example, Joey is kind of the front end of the avocado season with like July, August, it's ripening. And then Brogdon is kind of in the middle. So that's gonna be our August, September, October. Brogdon's a big black avocado, but it's so creamy and good. It's not like that native Florida trashy, waxy avocado. The Brogdon is really nutty and creamy and it just goes great on toast. Uh, really good guacamole. It's my favorite one for guacamole. And then the winter Mexican is the latest of the season. And so that's gonna be like November through February, even the first week of March, the winter Mexican will last, but super easy. And next to a lot of our avocados, again, we do a moringa for chop and drop because that's building the biomass and the soil. And then we'll have a pigeon pea on the other side. So they're getting a nitrogen fixer and we're doing a soil builder on all of our avocado trees. So you'll notice there's a, a nitrogen fixer, uh, avocado, another nitrogen fixer. So even around this Mexicola, we've got our moringa on each side, some radishes, there's some um, clover that's growing up in there. Everything is helping build that soil structure. And then around the base of our avocados, we just compost in place. So these are some of the, cu uh, the cuttings from turmeric and ginger. Those are going back dormant uh, this time of year. So we just cut the turmeric leaves, throw them at the base, they'll decompose. And then I have to weed less, which is always a good thing. Now back in this part of the food forest, it's a little bit more wild. So this is more, if you're doing permaculture, zone three, zone four in your permaculture system. So we have Moringa. Uh, this was a self-seeded pumpkin. It's a Seminole pumpkin that just decided, hey, I like the spot, I'm gonna show up. So we're just letting it do its thing. Uh, some avocados. This is the Brogdon avocado I was telling you about. And this one is about five and a half or six years old for the Brogdon absolute favorite for guacamole for your avocados and again there's another moringa tree on the side you can see all the way through the moringa trees and then this part of the food forest gets really thick so past the avocados here we have a java plum uh, back in there or jamun uh, we've got barbados cherry uh, that's a java ticaba uh, back in here is a cool plant called galangal Gallangal's grow structure is kind of like bamboo because it's very thick. It'll get to be eight to 10, even 12 feet tall. But the roots of the Gallangal are gonna be like really big turmeric roots, but they have a nice spicy note to it. Not spicy as in hot, but cinnamon, clove, nutmeg. 
So it goes really well in curry. In fact, I brought stuff in today. We're gonna harvest and do curry from the food forest today. And we're gonna use the greater gallon gal and lesser gallon gal in our curry today. Um, but it grows really nice as a hedge. This one is super thick in with this Barbados cherry. Uh, and even in the midst of the yerba mate plant in the back. The uh, java plum here is kind of all at the end of its season done for the year uh, but this gets nice very tart purple fruits on them and very prolific so a lot a lot of fruit if you're from the caribbean jamaica uh, the java plum is really popular down there they're a little astringent if you get them fresh so let them be really really ripe on the tree pop them off and eat them this is the greenhouse that we put most of our tropicals in for the winter um, some of these will actually go fully dormant um, for the winter. Now, mangoes will stay good. Uh, and here at the farm, we have about 50 varieties of mangoes, all sweet and non-astringent and non-fibrous because don't, we don't do any of the fibrous stuff. We actually had some ice cream mangoes this year, which is one of my personal favorites. Namdak Mai is one of the best tasting. Uh, we have the Alfonso, which is the most fragrant of the mangoes. Um, so there's just so many mango varieties to choose from. Even if you're in an apartment, you can do a dwarf mango that's gonna stay really short. Fruit, still in a pot. Julie is a really good one that's small. Pickering is my favorite. Big mango and then a five-year-old tree that you'll see a picture of in a minute, you'll get 40 to 50 fruit in one year on a five-year-old tree. I mean, just humongous. Yeah, these are the two of the dwarf mangoes. So this is the Julie. She's five years old and full grown. I mean, she's four or five feet tall. This probably had 30 to 40 fruit on it this year. Uh, a little bit smaller than your fist size fruit on a mango. The flavor of Julie is kind of pineapple-y. So it's very tart mango, a little bit sour, uh, but very high producer and it'll grow in a pot her entire life. Uh, this one is called Pickering. This is like an orange pineapple in flavor very high yielding and this is semi-dwarf so she maxes out at about eight feet tall uh, but it's a very dense growth habit i mean it almost looks like a shrub um, but really really good fruit so if you're you know in a small space the pickering is probably my favorite of the mangoes that are in the dwarf varieties second would be probably ice cream mango and namdak mai is a semi-dwarf so at about 20 feet tall um, which is really good tasting mango as well I think a lot of times we want to take care of our food forest like we take care of a house plant. And you don't have to. These do better when they're neglected. When you give them good organic matter at the base, and no, this is not going to look good in your front yard, but when you get down, I mean, this organic matter for Florida soil, I mean, that's amazing. Yes. And we're not bringing in compost or manure. This is just from chop and drop. All right, so if you are in Howie in the Hills in Central Florida, come on in and see us here at a natural farm. Uh, we offer free you picks during the year on muscadine grapes and olives, java ticabas. You're always welcome to come in the food forest to see, to learn, to experience. Uh, not only do we grow here and we're certified USDA organic, we also do in-home consultations. So we'll drive to you, help you come up with a good plan for your yard, for your family, to grow what is really right for you and to help you and your family create abundance right where you are. So thanks so much. Come on out and see us here at a natural farm.